On the other hand, having to deliver your products through your competitors um, is challenging and thinks, okay, because the closed ecosystem, because Apple basically won and set the, the terms of that. Get me talking about closed <laughs> platforms and I get angry. Um, <laughs> so We're not doing this because we're kind of altruistic people. I mean, we're doing it because we think that this is going to make the thing that we're building the best by, by kind of having a robust ecosystem. Well, I, I think that the open source strategy is going to be yeah, it's is going to be a good one as a business strategy. 안녕하세요. 엔드플랜의 마츠입니다. 여러분은 오픈 소스 전략이 왜 좋은 전략인지 알고 계신가요? 엔비디아의 CEO 제슨 황은 작년 AI 분야에서 가장 큰 사건으로 라마의 공개를 꼽았습니다. 메타는 올해에도 클로즈 모델에 뒤처지지 않는 라마 3.1을 공개하며 AI 오픈 소스 생태계를 선도하고 있습니다. 이번 영상에서 주커버그는 애플과 오픈 AI 같은 회사적인 생태계를 비판하며 오픈 소스의 중요성을 강조합니다. 사실 저는 수조원이 투입된 AI 모델을 무료로 공개하는 이유를 이해하지 못했는데요. 메타는 이전에 파이토치를 공개해서 얻은 이점이 있다고 합니다. 그 경험이 라마 공개로 이어졌다고 하는데요. 자세한 내용은 영상을 통해 확인해 보시죠. I thought Llama 2 was probably the biggest event in AI last year. But the reason why I said it was the biggest event was because when that came out, it activated every company, every enterprise, and every industry. All of a sudden, every healthcare company was building AIs, every company was building AI, every large company, small company, startups were, were building AIs. And, and then now, uh, 3.1 is out. And the excitement is just off the charts. And, and I, I think it's going to enable all kinds of applications. But tell, tell me about your, your open source philosophy. Where did I come from? And, you know, you open source PyTorch, and that it is now the framework by which AI is done. And uh, now you've open sourced Llama 3.1 or Llama. Uh, there's a whole ecosystem built around it. And so I, I think it's terrific. Yeah, so there's a, there's a bunch of history on, on a lot of this. I mean, we've done a lot of open source work over time. I think part of it, you know, just bluntly is, you know, we got started after some of the other tech companies, right, in building out stuff like the distributed computing infrastructure and, and the data centers. And, you know, because of that, by the time that we built that stuff, it wasn't a competitive advantage. So we're like, all right, we might as well make this open and then we'll benefit from the, from the ecosystem around that. So we, we had a bunch of projects like that. I think the biggest one was probably Open Compute, where mm -hmm. we took our server designs and the network designs and eventually the data center designs and published all of that. And by having that become somewhat of an industry standard, um, all the supply chains basically got or organized around it, yeah. which had this benefit of saving money for everyone. So by making it public, um, and open, we basically have saved billions of dollars from doing that. So that was an awesome experience. And then you know, we've done it with a bunch of our kind of infrastructure tools, things like React, PyTorch. Um, so I'd say by the time that Llama came around, we were sort of positively predisposed towards doing this. For, for AI models specifically, I guess there's a few ways that I look at this. I mean, one is, you know, it's been really fun building stuff over the last 20 years at the company. One of the things that, that has been sort of the most difficult has been kind of having to navigate the fact that we ship our apps through our competitors' mobile platforms. Mm -hmm. So in the one hand, the mobile platforms have been this huge boon to the industry, that's been awesome. On the other hand, having to deliver your products through your competitors um, is challenging, right? And, and I also, you know, I grew up in a time where, you know, the first version of Facebook was on the web and that was open. And then, you know, as a transition to mobile, you know, the plus side of that was, you know, now everyone has a computer in their pocket, so that's great. The downside is, okay, we're a lot more restricted in what we can do. So when you look at these generations of computing, there's this big recency bias where everyone just looks at mobile and thinks, okay, because the closed ecosystem, because Apple basically won and set the, the terms of that, and like, yeah, I know that there's more Android phones out there technically, but like Apple basically has the whole market um, and, and, and like all the profits and, and basically Android is kind of following Apple in, in terms of the development of it. So I think Apple pretty clearly won this generation. But it's not always like that, right? I mean, if you go back a generation, you know, Apple was doing their, their kind of closed thing. But Microsoft, which was, you know, it's, it obviously isn't like this perfectly open company, but, you know, compared to, to, to Apple with Windows running on all the different OEMs and different software, uh, and different, different hardware, it was a much more open ecosystem. And Windows, Windows was the leading ecosystem. It, it, um, you know, it, it basically, in the kind of PC generation of things, the open ecosystem won. And I am kind of hopeful that in the next generation of computing, 
we're gonna return to a zone where the open ecosystem wins and is the leading one again. There will always be a closed one and an open one. I think that there's reasons to do both. There are benefits to both. I'm not like a zealot on this. I mean, we do closed source stuff. I mean, not everything that we, that we publish is open. But I think in general for the computing platforms that the whole industry is building on, there's a lot of value for that if the software especially is open. So that's really shaped my philosophy on this for both AI with Llama and with the work that we're doing in AR and VR, where we're basically making the Horizon OS that we're building for mixed reality um, an, an open operating system in the sense of, of kind of what Android or what Windows was and, and basically making it so that um, like we're gonna be able to work with lots of different hardware companies to make all different kinds of, of devices. We basically just wanna return the ecosystem to that level where that, that's gonna be the open one. And, and I, I, I'm pretty optimistic that in the next generation, the open ones are gonna win. For, for us specifically, you know, I just wanna make sure that we have access to, I mean, this is sort of selfish, but you know, I mean, it's, you know, after building this company for a while, um, one of my things for the next 10 or 15 years is like, I just wanna make sure that we can build the fundamental technology that we're gonna be building social experiences on because there have just been too many things that I've tried to build and then have just been told, nah, you can't really build that by the platform provider that at some level, I'm just like, nah, that for the next generation, um, like we're gonna go build like all, all, all the way down and, and make sure that, get me talking about closed <laughs> platforms and I get angry. Um, <laughs> so, hey, look, it, it is great. I think it's a great world where there are people who are dedicated uh, to build the best possible AIs, however they build it, and they, make, they, they offer it to the world um, you know, as a service. You know, I do think there's this alignment where, I and mean, we're building it because we want the thing to exist and we want to knock it cut off from some closed model. But it, this isn't just like a piece of software that you can build. It's, you know, you need an ecosystem around right. it. And so it's, it's almost like, it, it kind of almost wouldn't even work that well if we didn't open source it, right? It's, it's not, we're not doing this because we're kind of altruistic people, um, even though I, I think that this is gonna be helpful for the ecosystem and we're doing it because we think that this is going to make the thing that we're building the best by, by kind of having a robust ecosystem well, look, around. Look how many people contributed to PyTorch ecosystem. Constantly. Yeah, and it's, it's also just when something becomes something of an industry standard, other folks do work around it, right? So like all of the silicon and the systems will end up being optimized to run this thing really well, which will benefit everyone, but it will also work well with the system that we're building and that's, I think just one example of how this ends up being, um, just being really effective. So yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think that the open source strategy is gonna be, yeah, it's is gonna be a good one as a business strategy. I, I think people still don't quite well, get- Well, we, we love it so much, we built an ecosystem around it. We built this thing yeah, called you guys AI awesome Foundry. Um, and, and I recognize an important thing. And I, I think that Llama is, is genuinely important. We built this concept to call an AI factory, uh, AI Foundry around it. Uh, so that we can help everybody build. Take, you know, a lot of people, they, they, they have a desire to uh, build AI. And it's very important for them to own the AI because once they put that into their, their flywheel, their data flywheel, that's how their company's institutional knowledge yep. is encoded and embedded into an, an AI. So they can't afford to have the AI flywheel, the data flywheel, that experience flywheel somewhere else. So, and, and so open source allows them to do that, but they, they don't really know how to turn this whole thing into an AI. And so we created this thing called an AI Foundry. We provide the tooling, we provide the expertise, uh, Llama uh, technology. Uh, we have the ability to help them uh, turn this whole thing uh, into an AI service. And, yeah. and then when, when we're done with that, uh, they take it, they own it. We, the output of it's what we call a NIM. And this NIM, this, this Neuro Micro NVIDIA inference microservice, uh, they just download it, they take it, and they run it anywhere they like, including on-prem. And, and now we're, we're off helping enterprises all over the world do this. I mean, it's really quite an exciting thing. It's really all triggered off of uh, the Llama open sourcing. Yeah, I think especially the ability to help people distill their own models from the big model yep. is going to be a really valuable new thing. Because I, 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 there's this, you know, just like we talked about on the product side, how, at least I don't think that there's going to be like one major AI agent that everyone talks to. It's... At the same level, I don't think that there's going to necessarily be one model that everyone uses. We have a chip AI, chip design AI. Yeah. We have a software coding AI. And so each one of these AIs are fine-tuned off of Llama. And, and so we fine-tune them, we guardrail them. You know, if we, if we have, a, if we have a, uh, an AI design uh, for, for, uh, uh, for chip design, uh, we're not interested in asking it about politics, you know, and religion and things like that. So we guardrail it. And so, 
So I think, I think every company will essentially have, for every single function that they have, uh, they will likely have AIs that are built for that. And they need help to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the big questions is going to be in the future, to what extent are people just using the kind of the bigger, more sophisticated models versus just training their own models for the uses that they have? And at least I, I would bet that they're going to be just a, a just vast proliferation of yeah. different models. People, We use the largest ones. The reason why we do it is because the, the engineers' times are so valuable to us. You know, we want to use the best possible model. The fact that it's cost effective by a few pennies, who cares? And so we, we, we just want to make sure that the best quality of result is presented to them. Yeah, well, I mean, the 405, I think, is about half the cost to inference of the GPT-40 model. So, I mean, at that level, it's already, I mean, it's, it's pretty good. But yeah, I mean, I think people who are doing stuff on devices or want smaller models, they're just going to distill it down. So that's like a whole different set of services. That AI is running, and let's, let's pretend for a second that we're hiring that AI. That AI for chip design is probably $10 an hour. You're using, you know, and, and uh, uh, um, if you're using it constantly and you're sharing that AI across a whole bunch of engineers, so each engineer probably has an AI that's sitting, sitting with them that doesn't cost, you know, doesn't cost very much. And we pay the engineers a lot of money. And so, so to us, a few dollars an hour uh, amplifies the capabilities of somebody that's really valuable. If you haven't hired an AI, do it right away. That's all we're saying. 여기까지 보셨다면 이어서 메타의 다양한 연구들이 총 집약된 스마트 글라스 산업 이야기도 들어보세요. 이 기기는 스마트폰 다음 플랫폼이 될 가능성이 높은 혁신적인 기술로 주목받고 있습니다.